Hi, Jack. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Very well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing fine. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Jack Goldsmith, and among other things, you are the author of this fascinating book, In Hoffa's Shadow, A Stepfather, a Disappearance in Detroit, and My Search for the Truth. This is what it looks like if you listen to it on an audio book, which is the way I imbibed it. Um, now, we just uh, taped another conversation that I hope people have listened to, which is about what you might call the true crime part of the book. Turns out your stepfather, Chucky O'Brien, and really the only true father figure in your life, um, was long thought to be the man who drove Jimmy Hoffa to his uh, almost certain death when he disappeared in 1975. Uh, and the book uh, is largely about that. But there's a second dimension to it, which has to do with your professional identity. You're a professor at Harvard Law School. You were in the Justice Department during the George W. Bush administration. You played an important role in handling some civil liberties and surveillance issues. And it turns out there's an intersection between uh, that part of your life and the Jimmy Hoffa part of your life, which is fascinating in its own right, because Hoffa's disappearance turned your whole family life upside down. Um, and you it, that's what inspired you ultimately to try to get to the bottom of the question of whether Chucky was indeed involved in Hoffa's disappearance. Turns out there's very good reason to think he wasn't. But this conversation uh, is going to focus on um, the kind of politics policy dimension of the story, um, and uh, which in a way goes way back, certainly to Bobby Kennedy's war on Jimmy Hoffa which raised civil liberties questions um, and even further back because those questions, the, the, the ground for that whole war was paved by things that happened, uh, you know, with uh, in the Eisenhower administration, even the Roosevelt administration um, that involved uh, J. Edgar Hoover often. Before we get into that, why don't you talk about how you start uh, the book, um, the, the, the scene you, you set at the very beginning? Sure, thanks. Um, so I opened the book with me sitting in my office in the Justice Department. I was the head of the Office of Legal Counsel. I was working on a program called Stellar Wind, which was the Bush administration's warrantless surveillance program to try to find information about al-Qaeda and associates and to try to st stop them from making another homeland attack and figuring out where they were. Uh, I was been on the job about two months, six weeks or so, and I discovered serious, serious legal problems in this program. I had a duty every six weeks to examine its legality, and I was in the middle of doing that. It was an extremely stressful time. The threat reports in the government about another attack were very high. Here I was tinkering with and thinking about pulling back on legal grounds on a program that people in the White House and the intelligence community thought was vital. So it was enormously stressful. This was, you know, even reconsidering the programs where legality was kind of unprecedented. So it was a stressful time. I was sitting in the Justice Department reading Fourth Amendment opinions, trying to become ex more expert than I was on the Fourth Amendment, which is the provision of the Constitution that uh, basically protects privacy, protects, prevents the government from engaging in, a, in unreasonable searches and seizures. And I'm reading along these cases, and I'm reading one case, and I come along a citation called O'Brien versus United States. And O'Brien turns out, I, I, mean, I almost immediately knew, I said, I said to myself, wow, that can't be, can it? Because it was also, the next citation was Hoffa versus United States. Uh, so I printed these cases out, and it turns out that the case, O'Brien versus United States, was about my stepfather, Chucky. He, this is the man who, as you say, raised me. And it was startling for a number of reasons. Uh, one, as a teenager, Chucky had always, in a kind of inarticulate, kind of uninformed way, since he didn't know about the law, but he had always claimed that the government illegally surveilled him. He claimed that the government always did all sorts of things in, illegal in secret, that they cut corners, especially with regard to surveillance. He called it backup, because by which he meant they can interpret the law however they want to protect themselves in secret, even when they're enforcing it against others. I didn't really believe any of that, uh, especially when I went to law school and I kind of had a falling out with Chucky. I didn't believe anything of any of that that he told me. And here I was in the Justice Department uh, 
being one of those people that he used to complain about. And I came across this opinion that basically was a case about Chucky himself being illegally surveilled by the government and by uh, the Supreme Court ruling that his case had to be vacated because of that illegal surveillance. And so it sort of confirmed in a very sharp way. It, it, it was the it was the event that led me to begin to reconsider Chucky, and it also put my current position in you know very sharp relief because here I was knee deep in a program that was of doubtful legality at least in parts, and I was struggling with where to draw the line. And suddenly, it turned my whole world kind of I don't want to exaggerate it, but it was a pivot point for on a lot of grounds, both in terms of what I was doing and in terms of me thinking about Chucky, because it turned out one of the premises of me blowing him off 20 years earlier was, is that, you know, he was a liar, didn't understand what he was talking about. I was this virtuous kid on the way to a legal, uh, hopefully promising legal career. And here I am in the justice department working on something that isn't ter- obviously legal and it turns out he was right about what he had said in the, about the 50s and 60s. Okay. And I want to say that people um, who haven't listened to our first conversation can hear a lot of this fleshed out. In, in, in particular, your falling out with Chucky, uh, subsequent rash, rapprochement, which is, which is uh, kind of uh, tied up with the writing of this book, um, and I want to, by the end of this conversation, I, I, I want to ask you to what extent um, you think your experience with, with, with Chucky, the way you had been in a, in a weird way deeply involved with uh, Hoffa's disappearance in the sense that it really did turn your, your family life upside down, to what extent that may have shaped a uh, decision you, you actually made in the Bush administration, which were consequential. I mean, I mean, part of the story, your story in the Bush administration, it, it includes this like kind of famous scene where I guess Alberto Gonzalez goes to the hospital and tries to get a sedated Attorney General John Ashcroft to sign off on some kind of constraint on on civil liberties and 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 so on. It, it, it's really important stuff that happens when you're in the administration. I want to I want to get back to the question of of how uh, your own role of it may have been shaped in a weird sense by Jimmy Hoffa. But first, let's, let's start uh, with, a be- you know, nearer to the, to the beginning of the whole kind of political history of these questions about surveillance and civil liberties. Um, and, and let's do that by talking about uh, J. Edgar Hoover and his, uh, shall we say, interest in surveillance. Right. So Hoover becomes, at a very young age, the director of the FBI. In fact, he became the director of, I can't remember the name of what it was called before it became the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Very early on, he becomes enamored with um, electronic surveillance, either telephone wiretaps or um, listening in on a radio conversation or... Um, miniature microphone surveillance where you break into a room or you place a bug in a room and you listen in from a distance. And the government starting then uh, became obsessed with electronic surveillance of various sorts because it is this incredibly powerful tool to learn about what's going on that's relevant to national security and, and law enforcement. It enables the government to listen in when people are having candid, unguarded conversations that they don't know is being recorded. It it allows them to do so in a kind of persistent way. And the government has always been obsessed with the very valuable information it get and, and, and with the very valuable information it gets from these from these tools. At the same time, there are obvious privacy concerns. These tools basically allow the government to go into our most intimate spaces and find out the most intimate things about us, and it's very easy to abuse it. We can get to this maybe later, but when Franklin Roosevelt started off the cycle of basically uh, circumventing legal restrictions on surveillance, he noted in the very memo he wrote, he said that the potential for civil liberties abuse is very high, and it's always been very high because... Uh, first of all, there's the Fourth Amendment, which stands for the proposition that the government's not supposed to be invading these spaces without a very good reason. And because, uh, you know, it's just it's just very easy for the government to listen in on everything they want and uh, get carried away with it. 
So the, the history of the way this has worked out since the beginning is the government is desperate to get this information. They love these tools. Congress and the courts in various ways have put up hurdles based on civil liberties and the Fourth Amendment and related concerns. And there's been a back and forth in which the government, it kind of in secret, tries to circumvent these hurdles, often does. The reason it's able to circumvent these hurdles is because the legal hurdles are being interpreted in secret and the government's interpreting them. And we worry today about secret law. That's a big topic post 9-11 about secret executive branch interpretations that enable the government to do things that might not seem right. It started in the 30s and 40s. And I go through with a series of really remarkable Justice Department justifications for Hoover to expand his surveillance activities really in the teeth of Supreme Court decisions. I focus mostly on microphone bugs rather than te uh, telephonic uh, interceptions because that's where the that was most relevant to the mob and that's where the greatest legal abuses were. Right. So anyway, that's the basic dynamic. So Roosevelt himself uh, signs off on a secret finding is a secret interpretation. Is that is that accurate? Basically, Robert Jackson, there was a case in the Supreme Court that said that a communications statute. Uh, it was an ambiguous case. It said the communications statute meant that the, Jackson interpreted the decision to say that the government could not engage in electronic wiretapping. This was in the right before World War Two. Hoover is paranoid about German saboteurs throughout the country, as is Roosevelt. Hoover complains to Roosevelt that Jackson's interpretation of the Supreme Court opinion to stop uh, the electronic surveillance is basically, he didn't use these words, but it's the same idea, making the government go blind, the going blind problem that we hear about today. Roosevelt looks at this, and he basically overrules Jackson's interpretation of the Supreme Court decision he said, yes, there are civil liberties concerns here, but I just can't believe the Supreme Court had national security in mind when it made this ruling. So basically, he allowed Hoover to continue to surveil despite and basically overruled Robert Jackson, who acquiesced in the ruling. So that was really the first important secret legal interpretation to circumvent legal checks on electronic surveillance. And it was an important foundational decision that would be cited for the next 50 years, I actually cited it, in my opinion, in 2004 and talking about stellar wind. We can get to that later. Mm -hmm. So then there's another um, inter secret interpretation in the Eisenhower administration, which I think kind of underscores uh, how how loosely we're using the term interpretation when we call them interpretation. Correct, correct. It's, it's kind of an invention, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and then this involves um, uh, Herbert Brownell, who was uh, Eisenhower's attorney general. Um, what tell us about that one? So there were a series of so there's electronic surveillance, there's telephone surveillance on the one hand, and that was actually legally ambiguous. And so we'll just set that aside. What we're talking about now are microphone wiretaps and often to plant these bugs, as they're called, the FBI had to break in to a home or an office and plant them there. And that's a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment. It's, it's a trespass, and it's a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment. And the Supreme Court had been saying so going back a couple of decades. And there's an arguable justification that maybe you're allowed to do this for national security purposes because there the president's powers are different, and maybe you read the, stat the, the legal rules differently. What Brownell did was he basically, when Hoover, when it became clear in the 1950s that Hoover finally woke up to the problem of the mob, he had for decades ignored it for a variety of reasons. He finally woke up to the problem of the mob and he had to play quick, catch up quickly. And he wanted to put in microphone bugs into basically all the mob offices, which he ultimately did. But to do so, he needed a new legal interpretation that took these national security justifications for bugging, which were themselves legally tenuous. And he applied that to the mob context, which is not about foreign influence. It's about domestic crime. It's absolutely at the core of what the Fourth Amendment is meant to get at. And Brownell, in the most casual, unconvincing of interpretations, writes Hoover a memo, a memo, by the way, that Hoover drafted, essentially, uh, writes Hoover a memo saying, yes, you can go after uh, the mob as well, and you can trespass and break in because, as he said, I think this is a quote from the opinion, national safety is at stake. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, it's hard to exaggerate without getting into the documents what a 
this was a preposterous interpretation of an already dubious legal interpretation. It all happened in secret, but Hoover had his sign-off from the Justice Department. It's very much like, you know, what people worry about in modern times, and he and he proceeded to uh, sort of break into and surveil by microphone many, many dozens of mob figures around the country. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, I think this is a quote from I, I think the Brownell ruling you're talking about, and this comes from your book. It says, "Quote." Considerations of internal security and the national safety are paramount and therefore may compel the unrestricted use of this technique in the national interest. The unrestricted use in the name of anything you can call internal security or national safety. Um, that's the that's the the magic quote, right? That's the magic quote. It sounds suspicious on its face, but I promise you it's much worse in the context <laughs> of the legal materials he's building on. It's just it's it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous interpretation. They knew it, too. Um, again, there were Supreme Court decisions that said trespass for the purposes of planting a bug was a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment. And this happens again and again, these secret rulings. And this is just, in effect, a secret ruling that says, screw the Supreme Court. We're, we're overturning their decision and we're doing it in secret. And I, I had a thought while I was reading your book, I thought, you know, I've always when I read about some like Banana Republic where they're implementing martial law, I always think, man, I'm glad I don't live in a country like that. But in a way, that's better because at least they're transparent about what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're telling you we're suspending civil liberties. Our government repeatedly just does it in secret. And a question I have for you. Has anybody, would there be a way of getting the Supreme Court to rule on the constitutionality of secret interpret, quote, interpretations, right? What, I mean, why can't we live in a country where, okay, fine, the, the, it's a strong executive branch. It can say this is our bizarro interpretation of what the Supreme Court said, but they always have to say it publicly. What would be wrong yeah. with that? Well, I say I think that's a great rule. Let me just back up and then I'll work up to that. Um just for the record, what was going on in the 50s and 60s that gets exposed and discussed in the church committee in the 70s, that was the worst. I mean, it was it was really an, an era and a culture of lawlessness where the people acting in secret felt that the ends justified the means. And it was a culture in which that really wasn't challenged. And these were upstanding attorneys generals and assistant attorneys generals and and so that was, and it was a really, really bad period. And all you have to do is read the church committee to see just how bad it was and to see just how little legality mattered. Um, as for secret legal interpretation, it's actually quite complicated because of the Constitution. The Constitution, Article 2, gives the president the power to interpret the law for the executive branch. And that has been a feature of our Constitution since the very beginning. George Washington exercised that power. And it's always been a dangerous power because presidents can interpret the law opportunistically to serve their ends. So it's always been a problem. Um, and oftentimes, you talked about the Supreme Court, these things come up in a way that it, you can't get it to court. You can't get it to court because it's secret, no one knows about it, or you can't get it to court because no one has a right to sue. Sometimes it gets to court. In fact, the way this practice ended in the 60s is when the government was going after someone who figured out that he was illegally surveilled and he called the government on it and then that leaked out and then the Supreme Court got wind of it and then the Supreme Court demanded to know how much of this is going on and the like. But it's often difficult for the Supreme Court itself to uh, super to supervise or adjudicate these cases because there's often not a vehicle to get these cases to the Supreme Court. But so the, I guess, I mean, first of all, you say, well, things were worse back then, but my my, my point is kind of, we have no way of knowing, really, how bad things are right now. That's the whole point of this secret interpretation power. For all you or I know, things are worse now. I mean, strictly speaking, I'm sure you have good, I'm sure you have more knowledge than I do, and we can safely say things aren't as bad then. But the point is, they can always get way worse, and nobody will know. So, I mean, does it see... But can I correct it, you on that? Can I just push yeah. back on that for one second? Sure. And then ask what you want. We don't know what we don't know. But we've been through a series of reforms, none of which are perfect, starting in the 70s and then again after 9-11. And the whole, the problem, and I'm not saying the system's perfect and there are still abuses and 
I agree with you to some extent, but I have much more confidence now than I did then. And by the way, I was in the middle of this stuff in 2004 in a, in a breakdown in the system. So I'm not, I'm not wide eyed about this. The, the, the problem was back then it was basically J. Edgar Hoover and the attorney general. Mm -hmm. There was no reporting to Congress. There were no legal standards at all. There was no internal transparency. The things weren't being lawyered to death. There was no inspector general. We've developed a whole series of institutions starting in 75 and going on thereafter that makes the whole process inside the government much more transparent, much more proceduralized, much more legalized, many more eyeballs on it. And so the completely off the reservation, we're just going to ignore the Supreme Court and go forward decisions. I'm not saying it can't happen. It is much, much harder for that to happen. We, we have improved the system. Now, what was your question? I'm sorry, I interrupted because you're you. No, and that's because you're in part because you're now supposed to tell Congress at least you're supposed to tell Congress that the law requires you to get sign off by the court. You, you, the, and, and again, the Bush administration circumvented some of these things, but it didn't last 40 years like it did with Hoover. It lasted about a year and a half before the internal processes, even after 9-11 and the fear of the post 9-11 world. There are just many more eyeballs on the problem inside the government and in other branches. You now have an Article Three court involved. You have mandatory reporting to Congress, all of which was going on to some degree even after 9-11. So, again, while I don't want to be naive, okay. I just think it's, it is, it's one of the things I think we can have more confidence about now than in the early, the early so, 60s. So unilateral secret interpretation by the executive branch that never leaves the executive branch is supposedly illegal now. No, no, I didn't say that. No, no. Um, I said that. Well, that never leaves the executive branch. It, it it sometimes goes to the FISA court, the secret court. We're talking right. about highly classified national security matters. That's the, what we're focusing on now. Right. Which was not really the situation in the early '60s. It's it goes to a court. It's reviewed by court. It's parts of it are reported to Congress. There are adversary institutions inside the government. Again, I don't want to – I've been a critic okay. of this. I don't want to be naive. I'm just telling you that the, in, the institutional structures should give one much more confidence now than in the, the early 60s okay. and late 50s. There are more safeguards now. So then – but it is the case, I gather, that Edward Snowden revealed stuff that surprised everyone in Congress, for example. Is that true? Not everyone in Congress because some people in Congress knew about it. They did. But yes, Snowden revealed a lot of stuff that was very, very surprising. Yes, true. OK, so let's go back to the uh, historical part. So and, and get into the Hoffa stuff. So Bobby Kennedy in the late 50s is, I guess, counsel for a congressional committee that's looking into Hoffa and organized crime. I think it's called the McClellan Committee. He winds up getting something of a bee in his bonnet about Hoffa, and, and and he continues to pursue him when he's attorney general in the Kennedy administration. What do you think um, – how did it start? What do you think his motivation was? Why did he come to be so obsessed? He started off looking for a cause that would help raise his profile and his brother's profile to run for the 1960 election, and he – you know, he was looking for a cause. He was an angry young man. He was moralistic and self-righteous, and he was looking for an evil that he could expose, basically. Uh, and he stumbled upon the Teamsters Union and labor racketeering and labor mob relations, and it was just the perfect thing for him because Hoffa did represent what Kennedy viewed as amorality, corruption, and the like. So he immediately latched onto this and convinced McClellan to organize a committee for it. And then Bobby was the lead investigator. As soon as he met Hoffa, he actually met Hoffa before the hearings began. They immediately hated each other. They each represented what the other hated most. I mean, for for Hoffa, Bobby Kennedy was this overeducated, rich, preppy kid who'd never done a hard day's work in his life and didn't know anything about the working man. His dad was a booze guy, as Hoffa put it. And for Hoffa, Bobby just kind of reeked of hypocrisy, and it was and Hoffa couldn't stand hypocrisy, especially in the government. And then once Bobby started going after Hoffa, he hated him even more. For Bobby, Hoffa represented open indifference to law, open indifference to criminality. Bobby was convinced in a way that wasn't quite accurate that Hoffa was ripping off the union for his own ends when it was more complicated than that, as we discussed in the last show. Mm -hmm. And then once they started clashing, 
And Hoffa kept wiggling free from the thing when, when Bobby was trying to pin him down. Bobby grew more and more frustrated, got more and more aggressive, cut more and more corners. And the whole thing kind of spun out of control, actually. And when he said, uh, when Hoffa says uh, Kennedy's own father was a booze guy, he means he had his own connections to organized crime. In a yeah, sense, he right? was involved. I don't know the details, actually, but but Joseph Kennedy was definitely involved in, allegedly involved in um, running alcohol and prohibition. And apparently that's how he made some of his money. And in that connection, he got to know organized crime figures. That's what Hoffa believed. Mm-hmm. And um, Kennedy, I mean, among the things I... Uh, in fact, maybe did you uncover this when you were at the uh, Bush administration? But the, the fact that Robert Kennedy signed off on the surveillance of Martin Luther King, which was it seems to have been extremely abusive, certainly in what it culminated in, which is the FBI sending him a letter trying to get him to commit suicide, trying to get King to commit suicide right. Um, what, 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 what was the story there? The story there was, this was really a Hoover operation to surveil King. I mean, the FBI at the time was surveilling on a large scale and trying to manipulate and threaten these organizations that it, that it viewed as subversive. King, uh, Hoover viewed Martin Luther King as subversive. He thought he had communist connections and he basically set out to ruin his life and, and to basically decapitate him. And, they did this through surveillance. They had evidence of his affairs, of King's affairs, and they tried to use this against King to get him to step down. They tried to talk to pressure him into killing himself. It was just terribly awful stuff. And Bobby Kennedy signed off on it. Uh, and there's a you know, piece of paper that which Martin Luther King basically in, in a paragraph describes what he views as the threat of Martin Luther King. It's the kind of thing that today, by modern standards, is a joke. It provides no evidence for the predication that he's a threat. It has no limitations on it. It's just an open-ended authorization to surveil King, and Bobby Kennedy signed off on it. And that this document— is, This is well known. It, it, was it well known before you—I mean, yes, you came I mean, across a document affirming it when you were in the yeah, Justice— so I, I talk about a story in the book where— I actually didn't know about the, the document and the event is well known. It was discussed a little bit in the church committee, but I didn't know about it at the time. When I'm in the middle of Stellar Wind, a guy named Jim Baker, who's a friend of mine, who was uh, the guy who was in charge of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court at the time, and he knew I was working on this program. He knew the Bush administration was cutting corners, uh, and he walks in with this piece of paper. And this is the piece of paper he had a copy of the of the letter and with that Hoover had written to Bobby, where Bobby signed off on this famously abusive surveillance. And he basically throws it on my desk and he says, is this what they want to go back to? Because this is where we're headed and I don't want to go back there or something to that effect. So it was Baker who brought that to my attention. And that, along with the Chucky precedent, opened up my world to these earlier rounds of abuse that were not unlike the kind of thing I was dealing with in 2004. Okay. So let's, let's get back to Bobby's kind of war on Hoffa. Um, what kinds of um, dubious things were done in the way of gathering evidence on Hoffa? So there are a whole bunch of things. Most of them were more unethical than illegal. I mean, the way he conducted the McClellan Committee drew lots of civil liberties complaints, even in the, even in the 50s because he would basically abuse and punish people for invoking their Fifth Amendment rights in a way that was thought to be unfair, couldn't call it unconstitutional, but unfair because there's not an adversary criminal process where someone can contest evidence. Bobby's hurling these charges against these mobsters and Hoffa. The mobsters, but not Hoffa, took the Fifth Amendment, and Kennedy ridiculed them and basically basically painted them as being guilty in a way that they couldn't contest because if they contested it, they would be able to in a criminal trial. If they contested it in the legislative context, they would have lost their Fifth Amendment rights. He was in league with um, the press in a very aggressive way in putting out very tendentious accounts of the witnesses and what they were going to tell. And of course, the press loved Bobby and hated the mob. So he won that war. The thing I didn't know about as much that I learned about was his really abusive use of the IRS. Thousands and thousands of files uh, gathered on all of Hoffa's friends without any reasons for suspecting them, both to try to 
go after them and therefore pressure Hoffa, but in general to, pre- to pressure Hoffa. A couple of times he actually violated criminal laws when some of these IRS some of the IRS information ended up in the congressional record. That's those are the, the main abuses. He was trying to interfere as a legislative staffer in the Teamsters election in 1957. A whole list of abuses. They were seen as abuses at the time by civil libertarians, but and it, and the techniques were very much like McCarthy's techniques. And Bobby Kennedy worked briefly for McCarthy. But the salience was completely different because the mob figures were completely unsympathetic. They were bad guys. They were clearly criminals. Bobby was this attractive figure. The press was very much on his side. So it played out very differently in the late 50s when Bobby was doing this, even though it was abusive. Mm -hmm. One thing that's interesting to me about the the abuses that did take place in the context of organized crime and and the the various, you know, and and the fact that. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover kind of had no trouble getting sign off on interpretations that would facilitate the prosecution of organized crime figures is, you know, in general, it seems to me that the great threat to civil liberties comes in times of great fear, right? There was great fear of communism in the 1950s. Uh, there was great fear when there was the Japanese internment uh, there was great fear after 9-11, but I don't quite understand why everybody was so terrified of organized crime. I mean, it's bad, but it's like there was never a time when the average American thought, you know, uh, this thing is out of control. Somebody could knock down my door any day and it would, you know, some mafia guy or something, right? Isn't that, isn't in that sense, it a little bit of an aberration? I missed that question because you froze. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, there was a, so uh, I just, um, I'll pick it up with, um, isn't, in that sense, isn't, isn't the the context of organized crime a little different from the context, the other context? You would think so. But by the late 1950s, organized crime came to be seen as an enemy within, just like those other enemies within that you described. And indeed, that's what Kennedy called them. And this happened for a couple of reasons. First of all, they were a truly insidious force in the country. They they controlled a whole set, a whole portion of the economy through coercion and extortion in a way that really wasn't on law enforcement's radar screen, but was really, truly insidious. And then the reason Kennedy was so worried, and this was a plausible worry, was Jimmy Hoffa controlled the nation's most powerful union. He controlled the transportation routes for the entire country. He could have brought the country to a halt. Mm. And so when you combine that power, that union power, with a guy whom Kennedy thinks is corrupt and in bed with the mob, he really did view it as a, a sinister threat within. Not without, I mean, it was a plausible contention. I think he exaggerated time, it, but it was an implausible contention. And that, and that seems to have been the case kind of from the beginning, from the 50s? That's the way Kennedy saw it and, and, or pretty early on. Um, and he talked about this in his book, The Enemy Within. He said basically, and his key point was, and he was right, that the Teamsters control the entire economy. They have the, the power with a strike to shut down everything because they are delivering everything, literally everything that we depend on. And that was at the height of kind of trucking power in the economy. And uh, when you combine that with being led by a guy who was corrupt and who was in bed with the mob, again, Kennedy exaggerated the extent to which this was a threat. Hoffa never would have used his power in that way. And Hoffa didn't have the extent of mob ties, even though he had a lot that Bobby thought. But it was it was a it was a. It was thought to be a really, really, really serious problem. And certainly Kennedy painted a pretty powerful picture in the enemy within and in the hearings that this was a an, not an existential threat, but a serious threat to the nation. OK. Um, at the same time, there is, there is an issue that comes up in your book, which is it's, it's not so much, I guess, an issue of illegality per se as a, as an ethical question. But the idea that um, when you go after somebody for something big and you don't get it, you keep pursuing, you start looking for anything down to parking tickets that will be grounds for dragging them back into court. I mean, in a, in a way, this kind of happened. Um, I mean, it, it wound up being something much bigger than a parking ticket that got Jimmy Hoffa in jail. But there is kind of a version of this 
that goes on with Hoffa, right? Yeah, this is a difficult issue because prosecutorial discretion it's a it's a very it's one of the government's most dangerous powers because as Robert Jackson said in a famous speech that I talk about in the book, you know, the prosecutor can investigate anyone, complete discretion. The investigation itself it can be life changing. It's not hard if you look hard enough to find a crime to pin on anyone. I mean, there are a lot of crimes in the federal code. And uh, so it's an enormously dangerous power. And the what Jackson basically said is you have to go after the crime and not the person. And that's always been kind of the norm. It's always been a norm that's, vi- that's not always adhered to. I mean, it's often the case that the government uses, you know, Al Capone they got for tax evasion, not for his mob activities, for example. That was a famous example of so-called pretextual prosecution. But the Kennedy Kennedy going after Hoffa was the paradigm case in American history. Uh, I mean, really, the idea that the Kennedy brothers were going to get Hoffa was apparent during the campaign. In the famous Nixon-Kennedy debate, the first one when Nixon had the five o'clock shadow, Bobby J- John Kennedy, in his opening speech, basically said, "When my bro- you know, when, when I become president, I'm going to put Hoffa in jail." And it was clear that they were going to go after him. And Bobby, when he became attorney general, set up a get Hoffa squad and he threw everything he had at Hoffa. And he was going to and it was it was clearly a vendetta and he clearly had lost perspective and he was going to get Hoffa at any cost. And so that's the it's a complicated issue of law on the edges of ethics and prosecutorial discretion. But that's the paradigmatic case of excess in American history. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is a tangent, but there are these theories that. The mob was involved in John Kennedy's assassination, uh, but, uh, you know, for reasons that that people might might gather. Do you do you attach any credence to those? Um, I am not the world's expert on that. I've read a bunch of books and there's a ton of circumstantial evidence, a ton of circumstantial evidence about the relationship between some mob figures and JFK's assassination. Um, but it's been looked at thoroughly, not just by the Warren Commission, but also, more importantly, in great detail. The mob part of it was looked at in great detail by the House in the 1980s. And while there are lots of circumstantial evidence, and certainly the mob had an interest in getting rid of Kennedy and his brother, I don't find convincing any of the evidence. I'm, I'm again, there's smoke, but I don't see any fire. I certainly don't think Hoffa was involved. I talked to Chucky a lot about that. And it would have been a very difficult thing for him to do, given how carefully he was being surveilled by the Kennedy administration at the time. Um, but again, there are, you know, there are books and facts that suggest there are circumstantial evidence to suggest they were involved. Lots of it, but nothing that I find really concrete and convincing. OK, so Hoffa for a while is eluding uh, RFK's grasp. There are unsuccessful attempts to prosecute him. Now, does he elude that grasp because he raises civil liberties issues that uh, are validated or it's just he just for one reason or another, the jury didn't quite do it? Well, it's not one reason or another. It's usually because he's buying off the jury, <laughs> which, which eventually did him in. But <laughs> which eventually did him in. They got they got lazy and they got caught, although that story is even more complicated than than history has told it. Um, so, first of all, Hoffa was very good at hiding his tracks, and he conducted himself in a way that made it difficult for the government to find uh, prosecutable crimes. As you say, they ended up getting him on two things that had nothing to do with the mob. The first one was when he Kennedy brought a case against him that never would have been brought, and it was controversial even in the Justice Department, a little misdemeanor case which Hoffa turned into a nuclear war. Uh, Even if he had lost, he probably wouldn't have gone to jail. He probably would have beaten it if he had done it honestly. But the jury in that trial was uh, tampered with on a massive scale, including Chucky was involved in that. I talk about that in the book. Uh, And they got caught. They got caught because there was a mole inside the Hoffa camp who was a close Hoffa aide who basically turned against him in a very controversial way. um, episode that was not obviously illegal, even though the Supreme Court upheld it over a dissent of Earl Warren. So they got them, you know, Kennedy succeeded ultimately because of Hoffa's collateral criminality, not because of his sort of mob related criminality. So, yeah, it's interesting. The, um, the, the issue of the mole, um, Hoffa raises that uh, as a 
as a civil liberties question, as I understand it, his contention in court, uh, and it did make it in the Supreme Court, as you suggest, right, was that for the FBI to plant a person uh, who's, who is, uh, I guess, actually recording what he said, or, uh, or no, just no, he was just reporting it. what he yeah. said. But Hoffa's, con- Hoffa's lawyer's contention was that was the equivalent of planning a recording device, yeah. right? Yeah, it was, and it was a pretty good argument. Uh, Earl Warren bought it in the Supreme Court. The argument was this guy who is a Hoffa associate who's actually working for the government is being let in voluntarily to Hoffa's intimate circle, including discussions with his lawyers. And Hoffa contended that that was like an illegal surveillance. And the court basically said, no, it wasn't the government breaking in. You voluntarily let him in. You voluntarily conveyed that information to him so you don't have a Fourth Amendment claim. Jumping way ahead, that's the same theory, the third party doctrine it's called, when you disclose something voluntarily to a third party, you don't have any Fourth Amendment protection in it if the third party reveals it to someone else. Exactly the same doctrine that I was dealing with in 2004, indeed it was a Hoffa precedent at the foundation of it, for the metadata stuff. The idea being when we turn over our telephone records to a phone company and then they voluntarily and they give it to a third party, there's no Fourth Amendment protection there. But anyway, that was the argument. Okay. So Hoffa does go to jail uh, for jury tampering. uh, And as we covered in our last conversation, that winds up in a certain sense getting him killed because of the effect it has on his mind and how he behaves um, afterwards. So I, I, um, so I guess people can see why you had heard growing up from Chucky, your stepfather, that the government plays fast and loose, that they play by their own rules. Uh, and so it's an unfair fight. Uh, it had been an unfair fight between them and Hoffa, between them and, um, and, and Chucky. Uh, so had you, how seriously had you taken that before you found yourself in the Justice Department uh, grappling with these very issues? Not seriously at all. I assumed, so Chucky was a famous exaggerator, often told untruths. I experienced this as a child. I thought it was funny, but I just basically, by the time I got to law school and I developed my view, my law school view of Chucky, I didn't believe him at all. I didn't take it seriously at all. So it was the, I mean, but had it been slowly occurring to you in the Bush administration that, wow, there is some some stuff going on uh, undercover? Or was it really just a big epiphany of uh, that moment when you came across the Supreme Court ruling while you were doing research in the in the Bush administration of, you know, O'Brien versus uh, whoever? And you realized, hey, there was he wasn't lying about this thing. His case went to the Supreme Court. Yeah. A couple of things. First of all. Before I found the Chucky precedent, I had already been developing serious doubts about the legality of this program. And I was decently far along the way in identifying those problems. And I was developing the opinion before I found the Chucky precedent that some of this stuff wasn't going to survive. And so that track was already on its way. And I was going down that track. It was kind of in the early to middle stages of figuring that out that I come across the Chucky precedent. And I hadn't been thinking, even when I was figuring out these problems in the government's program, I had forgotten altogether about what Chucky had told me. I wasn't even thinking about Chucky. Chucky was out of my consciousness because I had not talked to him in 20 years. So I was, but but, but when I found that precedent accidentally, and then it came rushing back what Chucky had said, that Chucky had told the truth, that I was very much involved with the kind of thing that Chucky had complained about and that there was a reality to what Chucky had said, both in the 50s and 60s and still going on in the government. I mean, it was a, epiphany is not the right word, it was a startling moment of realization. Now, I don't want to suggest that my worldview changed, I became a civil libertarian, that is definitely not what happened, but um, it, it, it definitely stayed in my mind the entire time I was in the department thereafter. Okay, now tell us about um, Stellar Wind, this whole thing that was at that point secret, right? It was a post-9-11 um, program of information gathering. Yeah, I can't, I still have to be careful talking about it because I don't know what's been declassified and what hasn't, even though a lot of it has. 
But I think at the most general level, it was a program instituted in the fall of 2001. It had a component that involved um, surveilling conversations that were one end outside the United States that uh, had a connection somehow to Al-Qaeda. And then it had another component of collecting massive amounts of metadata and using that, that giant pool of metadata to try to based on other predicates to try to ping the metadata to try to find unseen connections that might uh, find terrorists. That's basically how I can describe it. Okay, so... All of of which, the first part especially, seemed to be on its face in violation of the FISA statute, which for that type of surveillance seemed to require going to this court that I was talking about to get approval and a warrant before you engaged in that kind of uh, conduct. So it was the basic problem that uh, because the rules were so much looser for surveilling a foreigner, if any American was in conversation with the foreigner, in effect, the rules had been relaxed for that American as well. Was that part of the problem? No, it's actually even with regard to um, for the type of surveillance that was being done, which had one end United States, one end foreign, uh, with the possibility of a U.S. person on part of the conversation – I'm simplifying a little bit. The the statute required in that context before the government could surveil that it had to go to this court and get approval. And it had to show that the person on the other end was an agent of a foreign power and that there was enough of a predicate to surveil in that context. And what the Bush administration did was basically cut that out. It was the core innovation in 1978 to allow surveillance in this context to kind of repair what had happened in the 50s and 60s with surveilling foreign influence figures. The core innovation was to develop this court, which in secret could consider the classified evidence and sign off on these warrants. And that part of the program had circumvented that altogether. Okay. And then there was the whole metadata part where basically they don't know the contents of my uh, phone conversations and my texts, but they know everybody, every time I called anybody or texted anybody, that's the upshot of metadata? Basically, metadata is to from information and timing. So they know who you contacted and the time of the contact, among other things. That's the base. It's basically the outside of an envelope, not the inside, not the content. Okay. And what did you find most dubious about Stellar Wind and what did you do about it? Well, the whole th- this is very complicated, and I'll try to make it simple because it was enormously complicated. Um, so the whole thing was legally problematic, every single bit of it. Um, the way the program was put together in the days after 9-11 when everyone was scared to death, and it was done with corners cut, understandably, in my view, in those early days. I mean, it really was an emergency situation. But the problems included that to start with, the way that the program had was described as operating didn't actually match up to how it was operating. So the legal analysis was being done on something that actually wasn't going on. That was the first giant problem. I mean, the, the government, the executive, the Justice Department didn't even have a proper understanding of how the program worked, in part because of this terrible secrecy inside the government that the Bush administration imposed. The second part, again, I'm simplifying a great deal to try to make it accessible, was that all of the rules on their face, the easiest interpretation, all the rules seemed to be being violated for the whole program. They weren't getting a warrant. They weren't necessarily following the rules for the collection of metadata, although that was a closer question. And so... When I started learning about this and I started reading the opinions and I started reading the statutes, it became clear that the whole thing was screwed up from top to bottom. And so I – this was extremely complicated to understand and it was also extremely complicated to know what to do. I faced a completely unprecedented situation of a program that had been vetted for two and a half years that had been integrated into the national security bureaucracy that was churning out information relevant to 9-11 and – trying to figure out which parts could be saved, which parts couldn't be saved, what what even the legal standard was. Was I supposed to do a review as if I were approving it from the beginning? Was I supposed to consider it as a precedent and have what we call stare decisis, which is once something is decided, there's a high bar to overturn it? Uh, 
These were all complicated and unprecedented questions I had to face. I struggled with them. And essentially, and again, I'm simplifying a great deal, I split the baby. And I basically declared that half of the program was unlawful, or at least I, that, that's not quite the way I put it. I couldn't find legal support for half the program. And I found alternative legal support for the other half of the program. And as I talk about in the book, that was a bit of a stretch. I mean, and, and I was relying for the parts that I upheld. So I was considered a hero you know, when I got out and everything became clear considered a hero for pushing back on half the program, but a lot of people criticized me for upholding the other half of the program. And I still would have done the same thing that I did today. I thought about it for 15 years, but the interesting thing was I ultimately ended up citing the line of cases. One line of cases was the one that began with Roosevelt in the 1940s that we talked about earlier. And another line of cases was the one that traces its pedigree to Jimmy Hoffa about the metadata idea. The, the idea of the third-party doctrine that the Hoffa president helped to establish, I also ended up relying on that. That's a complicated mouthful. The bottom line is it was unprecedented all around. I wasn't quite sure what to do. I thought about it hard, and I basically split the baby, which was hugely controversial in the government. I mean, the government almost melted down as a result of that, cutting back the cutting back part. So when, when you issued this finding within the administration and circulated with the, in, within the administration, you got a lot of blowback. What, so Cheney's, Cheney's lawyer, David Addington, is that the guy who, who said you had just uh, ushered in the apocalypse or whatever he said? <laughs> when I first told him that this is what we were going to do, he said that I was going to be responsible for the 100,000 people who were going to be killed when, when they got blown up in the country. And as I've said many times, I, I don't begrudge Addington telling me that. He really believed it. He really believed that would be the consequence of this. He wasn't trying to scare me. And I was reading the same threat reports, or most of them, and I was damn worried that this is exactly what was going to happen. That's one of the main things. There were many things that made pulling back on the program so hard, but one was the fearful consequences of what might happen. I mean, really, the idea that uh, that someone comes along two and a half years after the program is over, pushes back on half of it, makes the government blind to the other half. If anything had happened, you know, it's all on me. And I would have been second guessed forever. Um, and that was the, those are the stakes that Addington was driving home to me. But frankly, I understood them before he told me that. Right. I mean, and this, there's a kind of asymmetry in the incentive structure. This happens in a lot of realms of life. But like, if you... Uh, you know, if you wind up uh, managing to kind of, in effect, veto stellar wind and there is no attack, nobody's going to come back 10 years later and give you a medal, even though you made the right call. But if there is an attack and, uh, you know, you're screwed, they're going to remember. And, and, and so this is another thing that in a way biases us kind of against civil liberties, right? That's Yes, that's fair. I mean, the, the government, um, look, whenever there's war or a national security crisis, civil liberties become a trade off because the government feels an incredible imperative and it's completely justified to keep us safe. And if they don't keep us safe, we complain about it. So, and they know that, the government knows that. So they're pushing every single margin they can, especially when they feel like they don't understand what's going on as they did shortly after 9-11. This is the same thing Hoover did in World War II. It's exactly the same thing when he was trying to find the Nazi saboteurs, when he was pushing the envelope then. The government feels this incredible imperative to figure out what it doesn't know. And it, there's definitely an asymmetry there pushing in that direction. Um, on the other hand, I was also worried, I'll tell you, and there was, there was factors on the other side. I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to try to apply the law correctly to the extent I could figure it out. There was also the idea that if I had signed off on this, I'm basically signing off on activity that some people might think is warranting criminal behavior. I mean, I, you know, there were criminal laws all around me. So there was the fear of violating criminal law. There was the fear of getting a lot of people blown up. There was the uncertainty of where exactly to draw the line. There was the uncertainty of knowing what the standard was for upending a program in the middle of it that had never been done before. It was, it was a fraught and very scary time. So was the upshot of your finding that Stellar Wind should not be reauthorized? About half of it. And that, was that the biggest kind of controversy? And that wound up being the case? It was not reauthorized fully? <laughs> 
Yeah. So this is what led to the hospital scene you alluded to. So yeah. basically, again, roughly half of it I could not find a legal justification for. Roughly half of it I could. Even the roughly half of it that I could was took a lot of work and and is open to criticism what I said and did. But that was not the focus at the time. The focus at the time was the part I said no to. That's what led to the famous showdown and the hospital scene and with the Bush administration and Cheney and all that. Ultimately, the president agreed to our interpretation, cut the program back in half. At that point, again, without getting into the details, for some of it, we tried to reconstitute the authorities of what they were doing. Instead of doing it unilaterally, we went to the FISA court and got FISA court approval for it, which I viewed as a more legitimate way of proceeding. The best way to proceed would have been to get Congress to intervene at that point and sign off on it, but there was this excessive fear of secrecy. In fact, there was a meeting the day before the big blow-up in the government uh, in which congressional leaders were brought to the White House, and Cheney told them, we've got this crisis on our hands, we can either keep going or you can give us legislative approval, but if we get legislative approval, approval we blow the whole program. The congressional leaders apparently, there was some dispute about this, said, keep going, we don't want to blow the program. It was a very, very, very tricky situation once you figure out that this thing is legally deficient. What do you do about it? Okay. And I know this is a hard question for you to even figure out, but do you think, if, had it not been for your experience with Chucky and that connection to Hoffa and the things he had been telling you about government abuse and the fact that he was a victim of it in a certain sense, um, your ruling would have been different? I think it would be an exaggeration for me to say that, but I don't know. And I'll just tell you how I think about it. Um, I was thinking about Chucky every day after that. I came across the citation and I was, it put my situation in a different light. And I understood that it wasn't just this little legal problem that I was connected to a longer set of issues. I can't say it would be a nice story to tell that, that, but I don't think it's true. To It'd be a great story. If I was your editor, I, w- I would have I said, say it in the book. It would be a great story, but I, I tried to tell the truth in the book. Again, he was in my mind the whole time, but I actually tried to. So one of the things I tried to do, I, again, it's, it's very hard for me to tell you how difficult this problem was. Because uh, I had all these pressures that people are going to get blown up pressure. You're going to commit a crime pressure. The Chucky pressure was there and the burden and anxiety of that. I tried my best. I tried to exclude all that stuff and just stay focused on the law and figure that out as best I could. There weren't often clear answers, but all that extraneous stuff that wasn't legal it was out there and it was in my mind, but I tried to separate it. And that was true of Chucky as well. That said, it had, I mean, it never left my mind the whole time I was there. It never, so I don't know how it, how it might have factored in. And did things, did, were, uh, did the causality work in the other direction? In other words, did your experience in government recognizing how much does go, go on under the, under the table, so to speak, kind of, was that part of the process of your warming up to Chucky? Well, yes, definitely. Oh, there's there, no doubt about that. The process, when I discovered this precedent, it just, and I started rethinking about all of my assumptions about him and all of assumptions about me and my virtue and kind of criticizing him. You know, here I am as a young man criticizing him for his illegalities and for his criminality and worried about my associations. Here he is telling me about this corrupt Justice Department that does these things. Suddenly, I find myself there doing, in some sense, the very thing that he warned about. And that's what I was doing. I was providing backup for half that program. And it definitely was part of the process that led me to see the plank in my eye and not the speck of sand in his. And um, to rethink the moral judgments I had made about him. The other irony was I never would have been in that position I never would have reached that level in the Justice Department had I not renounced Chucky. I never would have gotten the clearances I got. I never would have been in the position to be doing the very thing that Chucky complained that the government used to do that I didn't believe. So all of that definitely got made me rethink him and my relationship with him and my supposed virtue and his supposed lack of it. Yes. Okay. There's um, 
there's a theory, there's a worldview you see kind of particularly on the left, uh, and it goes something like this, like, um, you know, when fear sweeps the nation and politicians are fanning it, and certainly politicians say a lot of things that seem designed to fan fear, as do journalists, but there's a there's a view that they're just doing this so they can control us, right? It, it's it's part of the plan. Now, in your with your experience in government, is it that sinister, or are the dynamics a little different? It's not. I wouldn't say that no one does that, mm-hmm. and um, you know, but I don't. That's not the way I saw it when I was there. When I was there. And I would say this is true of David Addington and Dick Cheney as well. This is not going to be a, an opinion that's going to win me a popularity contest. They, everyone was reacting to a reality that they took seriously, and they were taking steps that they thought were necessary to meet that reality. And, you know, sure, sometimes there were issue items that were on the back burner, and this is an opportunity to implement those. But fanning, I, I didn't see fanning fear to manipulate us into accepting new restrictions. I mean, that's not the reality I experienced. The reality I experienced is a bunch of government officials with enormous responsibilities, tons of ignorance about the enemy, desperate to keep the country safe, taking aggressive steps, sometimes uh, cutting corners on the law to do so, but not telling themselves they're cutting corners. Mm -hmm. They never told themselves. No one who cut corners tells themselves they're cutting corners. They always convince themselves that they weren't. So anyway, to answer your question, that cynical story is not one I experienced. Yeah. And also, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but we alluded to it earlier. They don't want to be blamed for the next big thing, right? I mean, apparently Bush, right after 9-11, looked at his attorney general and said, don't let this happen again, which kind of blew my mind when I read that in your book, because it's like, um, I'm not sure the attorney general is the main guy responsible. Well, he was because of, you know, there was a lot of domestic counterintelligence stuff. Yeah. Okay. And there was the, in, there was the wall between surveillance and for us, there were, there were some, there were some issues for which Ashcroft was responsible. This is impossible to overstate. I mean, it really is. This happened to Obama also, the Obama administration. You remember the underwear bomber and how close yep. that came and they barely averted the underwear bomber and they all realized then this is well documented they all realized then holy shit we almost had a complete disaster on our hands we can't let that happen and they changed their attitude then right. they ramped things up and this is it's not it's not cynical it's real it's genuine it's an enormously difficult right. position that they're in and I don't know if this was after that or before, but Obama had uh, this guy Alwaki killed, if that's the pr- correct yeah. pronunciation. Yeah. And do, I, I personally sounds constitutionally dubious to me. He was an American who got no due process. But, um, you know, and Obama was reported to be freaked out by the underwear bomber. He said yeah. stuff, you know, yeah. and and he told his cabinet, not unlike what Bush told his cabinet after 9-11, he said, Listen, that was a very close call, and we've got to ramp things up, basically. And they did. Yep. So, um, and it's, you know, and it's funny because if you ask yourself, well, would the number of people who die on an airliner, if they died like once every 10 years, would preventing that be worth a major sacrifice of civil liberties? You, You might say no, but if you're a politician, It's such a huge political problem. If it's it's a no-brainer, the answer to that question is a no-brainer. And you would, whatever your politics are, if you're the president, you give the answer of prevent the attack. Mm -hmm. Obama came to office a genuine civil libertarian who genuinely wanted to change our war footing and overhaul the way we fought the war. And he didn't change much at all. Right. Because the reality is that it's just a hard as hell situation and you've got to use the tools you can to keep them at bay. You know, he he made some changes, mostly at the rhetorical and process level, but it's one should not exact you can't exaggerate what a difficult position people in the government in those jobs are. Mm-hmm. In my opinion. Okay, so I know you got to go in a few minutes, but the final <clears throat> final kind of policy question is how alarmed should we be by the Snowden revelations? And, and you know, and maybe also if you want to talk about it, what's your view of him? You know, hero, criminal, whatever. Uh, so I have a mixed view of him, and some of you might be surprised about my view of him. Uh, when you say how alarmed should we be, what do you mean? That he exposed government secrets? No, or no, that- no. By the, the secrets he exposed. Yeah. 
but I'm still not sure what you mean. So I'll, I'll just give an answer, and if I don't get it right, you can you can follow up. Um, so look, there's no doubt that what Snowden did was an, caused enormous damage to our national security. Enormous damage. I I divide up what he revealed into two buckets. Bucket one was the stuff, and this is a rough distinction. It's not a perfect distinction. Bucket one was the stuff he exposed about what was going on in the homeland to U.S. citizens. Uh, the stuff that was legally problematic, maybe unconstitutional. For that bucket of stuff, which was a small percentage of what he disclosed, I think you can make a genuine case of whistleblowing. You can make a genuine case of that as an act of civil disobedience that is justified. One test of whether it was justified is did it bring reform? Yes, it did. Did it cause an important debate in the country? Was some of the stuff he exposed widely viewed as illegal? All of those reasons, if he just had exposed that narrow stuff, we would have a very different conception of Snowden, in and my it, opinion. And is that all about metadata, that part? It wasn't just metadata. It was also the successor to Stellar Wind about um, um, collecting stuff from U.S. providers in the United States that had U.S. person information in it. So basically, the stuff he exposed about the collection of information involving U.S. persons, um, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on probably legal, maybe not in some respects, but there's a big question about it. And it sparked an enormous debate and it brought reform. And that stuff, I think you can make a powerful case for what Snowden did. I'm not saying I agree with it, but that's the stuff that's most justified. 90 some odd, probably 99% of what he exposed wasn't that kind of stuff. The vast majority of it was stuff that involved uh, U.S. techniques for intelligence operations abroad, including many against our adversaries. And that blew billions, literally billions of dollars of investments that caused enormous harm to our relationships, that it caused enormous national security damage to the extent that those techniques don't work as well anymore, that caused, for better or worse, uh, a rift between the U.S. government and U.S. tech firms that is still causing problems for our nation. Uh, all of that stuff, much less hard to justify, in my opinion. But one more thing about Snowden, and this is not widely understood. Whatever you think about the baskets of disclosures I just talked about, he did the country a great service. And so there's the cost side to national security. But there's an enormous benefit side. And the benefit side was he brought the intelligence services, especially the NSA, out of the shadows and into the modern world and made them much more transparent than they'd ever been before. When he exposed all that stuff, he forced them to start explaining what they did. They were completely unprepared in the early months. They couldn't even talk about it. They had a rule of secrecy at any cost. That was an untenable and inappropriate position. And given the size of the secrecy bureaucracy and the scale of what they're doing, Snowden forced them out of the shadows. He forced a national debate he made the NSA much more transparent. He, they're now much better at explaining what they do. They disclose much more than they used to. We had several national debates about the legality of what the NSA was doing. Shockingly, the Congress and the country, despite the controversies, basically reapproved and in some senses extended what the government was doing before Snowden. So in some weird sense, Snowden brought the NSA into the 20th century, made them more transparent, and legitimized what they've been doing all along, which is not what I'm, I'm sure not what he set out to do. Okay. Well, uh, that that that's quite a commendation that that part of it. So, um, well, thank you for taking the time. Um, again, the book is in in Hoffa's shadow. It's I, I just really loved it. And one one great thing about it is that it brings you in touch with these kind of policy and political issues we've been discussing in this conversation, but. Uh, it's that part is totally painless because because there's the whole true crime part, your own fascinating personal story, which we talked about in the previous conversation. And, you know, there's a genuine um, intersection between the two that I don't think you overplay in the book. Um, th that, that just makes it really a great um, seamless read. So I'm, I'm glad it's having success, getting great reviews. Uh uh, and um, I'm glad uh, y that you and you and Chucky, your stepfather, are on good terms again. Yep, Happy ending. Too. Happy ending um, so far. 
and and uh, thank, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for reading the book so carefully and for the great questions. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.